Hey guys, you know it's been a few days um, dealing with things. I, I was trying to stay busy over like the past week, but it clearly didn't uh, work out the way I intended it to. Um, my birthday was what, five days ago now, and it's I don't particularly enjoy it. I, it's a thing. It doesn't really matter for the purposes of this video, but. I believe the last video I had left off not saying uh, what the upcoming video was going to be. If I did, that's not what I meant to do, um, because I didn't know. And a few days after that, I'd come up with an idea and tried recording the video several times, and this is currently the seventh time doing so. Um, so if you're seeing that, uh, but, but yeah, that's how, that's how many times I've done this video. Approaches uh, crap. I had um, mentioned that there is a interesting tendency among the autistic to uh, group together into three sort of havens uh, for employment. Now, one of them sounds a little bizarre, unexpected kind of thing. Now, one of those makes complete sense. That's STEM. So, sometimes people say tech more specifically, but STEM. I should surprise absolutely nobody. That's the big stereotype, is nerdy tech, nerdy science person. Yeah, there's, there's validity to that. I'm not going to argue against it. I'm one of those guys. Not everybody who is autistic is, but that, that stereotype's not invalid. Another one of those that people don't really think of, but when you do think on it, it makes a lot of sense, is trade work. You're working with specific details. You have a specific task you got to do. Your level of interaction with others tends to be lower. Um, not if you're in a union. But if you're an independent contractor, you're working with a few people here and there, typically just the customers. Maybe you got um, one or two people working under you as a hand. Makes a lot of sense, actually. The other one that confuses people so much is acting. Now, there's numerous autistic actors. I've debated going through the whole list or whatever, but the thing is, it's boring and dry as all hell when I do that because I don't watch much TV. You can go look up these. One of the more interesting ones, because I think he's a fantastic actor, is uh, Sir Anthony Hopkins. Dude is a great, great actor. But He's far from the only one. As weird as it might seem, the autistic are actually overrepresented in acting. Now, if you've been watching this, it's probably not that surprising how that might come to be. And it's still probably a little bit, but I've been describing a lot of things that are not rooted in behavioral problems. They're not rooted in trouble under um, not knowing how to behave appropriately. They're rooted in things that are going to cause differences in behaviors, different perspectives, but they're not... It's not like we're talking about, say, oppositional defiant disorders. It's another kind of similar thing here. But if there's so much social difference, why would you be good at acting like another person? Now, this phenomenon happens so much that there is a specific name for it. The autistic tend to go with masking. In research, it tends to be called camouflaging. But in either case, they're talking about the same thing. I'm not going to delve too much into the specific research on camouflaging because I could just explain what it is, but I have a bunch of links down in the video description if you want to read specific details. Uh, there will be something about 
camouflaging that we're going to talk about. I am going to reference uh, the research, but masking, camouflaging, whatever. It's the idea of putting on essentially an act, acting like you aren't autistic, suppressing any of those autistic traits for the purposes of fitting in or whatever. And in principle, most people would think that, yeah, that's a good thing. You're, you're fixed. Oh, no. Oh, no. If this were some magic fix to autism, then we'd say, oh, you basically have a cure. But that's not what's going on. That's not the problem. And in fact, this carries many problems. We will get to that, but this is actually an incredibly problematic thing. Consider it. You, you've seen this in other people. Person acts like something they're not in order to fit into a specific group. They're dead set on fitting into this social clique in high school, and so they act like something that they're not. They give up on their own principles, their values. They, they'd be lose themselves in order to fit in. You see this in the workplace quite often where, because of the power systems that are in place, people are essentially forced to fit into very particular um, behavioral political categories that they are not a part of just so that they can have a job working on things that they like, instead of how do we get people with different views to get along with each other. There's entire fields devoted to that negotiation and social psychology and organizational psychology all deal with those kinds of things in different capacities. The reality is you have seen this and has it ever really been a good thing? No, usually you see the person developing emotional problems. It takes a toll on them. The last video I talked about ABA and kind of how it works and some of the problems that you wind up seeing. Most of that was oriented towards the more severely affected. Now, what is done with the less severely affected, myself included, is hyper-focus on you just need to behave differently, you just need to learn to behave exactly like everybody else, and you'll be fine. Of course, the thing is, that is an impossible goal. There are all sorts of different subcultures throughout the, even your local area that could not possibly happen. As a really easy to understand example, you need to behave and think exactly like everybody else. Now, say you're from the United States and you've got both the Democrats and the Republicans who are constantly fighting among each other because they have different views and different values and different belief systems and everything else that goes along with that. How do you possibly fit into both groups? We don't. You can't. You don't only see those differences in politics. You see those differences everywhere. That's why the cliques form in school. All of those are different subcultures, different groups of people, different tribes, if you're going with what I mentioned before, with moral tribes. This is an impossible goal and is why changing yourself to fit in is never healthy. Now, the focus on researching this camouflaging phenomenon in autism started a lot with the big push uh, to rethink whether autism was a primarily male disorder. There were some theories that maybe there is some kind of female protective effect that is responsible for why more males have autism. Some research into that, and it doesn't really seem like it's the case. We know that there is a genetic basis. We don't know why, because its genetic basis is very unusual. Normally, when you're thinking of genetic disorders, say Huntington's chorea or Down syndrome, you're talking about essentially a kind of mutation. It's a little bit different in Down because there's a chromosomal copy. Kind of important. But 
we typically associate these with a mutation, the gene that is supposed to produce a specific protein gets changed to where it produces a similar but malfunctioning protein. We've tried. We've looked for that. We've never found it. It doesn't seem to be there. So what other possibilities are there? Well, from epigenetics, we know that there's things like gene methylation. We've looked. We found a few examples. Doesn't really explain most of the condition. Okay. There are a few examples. There's another one called de novo copy number variations, where the fine, a perfectly fine gene gets copied. The gene's producing the right thing, but in different amounts, behaving differently. Isn't Maybe. Maybe more of those are on the Y chromosome. Because then, surely, that would explain why it's male dominated. Nope. Nope. In fact, of the 159 instances of copy number variations that I am aware of, there may be others, but these are the like the majority of the CNVs associated with autism, none of them seem to happen on the Y chromosome. So it doesn't seem to be male biased. So then people started thinking, well, maybe, maybe one of the androgens, one of the male hormones, uh, induces CNV. After all, uh, Males tend to be more varied in a lot of ways. Uh, if you look at like IQ distributions and tons of other things, males have a um, broader distribution. It's less biased. Uh, so you see higher rates of both retardation and incredible intelligence in males, um, but less of like average, whereas uh, females tend to be more um, con consolidated, condensed, however you want to describe that. They looked, found no link again. So it doesn't seem like this should be a male-dominated disorder. So we have to be missing female diagnoses, right? That's certainly what it looks like. So this was around the time where Simon Baron Cohen's idea of the extreme male brain hypothesis was still around. That's bullshit. We'll cover that in another video. Simon's theory is complete bullshit. I will tear some of that research apart. Um, but that's not what's going on at all. One of the easiest examples of how that's not going on is that um, you see higher rates of autism in the LGBTQ, all that other stuff, um, community. And based on that and descriptions from people who are autistic about their own sexuality, it seems like there's a less adherence to gender stereotypes among the autistic, um, whether that would be a higher degree of gender fluidity or I don't know. Um, sex theories or gender theories are not my thing. I don't care about that. Um, I don't care about the theory behind that. Do your thing. I'm all for that. I, I just... How that is described is not something that interests me. I just... I like what I like. I am what I am. You do your thing. But, considering that it certainly doesn't look like it's extreme male brain, you would expect to see, like, a ridiculous macho kind of thing, and that's not what you see. <laughs> But they, the, the, these wound up coinciding. And so what people wound up starting to, to think is, well, if we can't sex link autism to males, 
maybe it's going to present differently in females. And so they got on that kick for a while. And it did. It did wind up getting a lot more females diagnosed. And we were able to find that these, uh, these women presented with the same genetic and endocrinological and organ things that I've been describing. Uh, you know, difficulties with, or differences with the throat muscles, the difference with facial affects, the increased rates of constipation, and all those other things. And it's like, okay, you having a consistent thing going on, this is, this is clearly is affecting a lot more women than we originally thought. How do we miss this? The different idea in how the idea that it presents differently in women seems to make a lot of sense. Research is starting to get away from that um, because it doesn't it seems like the sexual stereotypes that the researchers hold about how women, men and women are supposed to be are what completely messed this up. I'm mentioning all of this with the stuff on masking or camouflaging, because what we thought was that camouflaging or masking is used more often in autistic women because they have better social skills and are therefore able to pick up on this stuff more often and utilize it more often. Therefore, I don't want to say hiding. That's what a lot of the research says. It's not a good way to describe it, but like it didn't get picked up by diagnosticians. Okay. I, I think that's probably a fair way to put it. Kind of makes sense, you know? Of course, then a lot in the autistic community were like, oh, yeah, yeah, hold, hold, hold up. I'm a guy. I exhibit a lot of that. Or people who had not been diagnosed and go, you know what, I have all these other things. I got told I wasn't autistic because I was doing this camouflaging thing that the diagnostician said excluded me. But you're saying the autistic females do this. And plenty of autistic females saying, I don't camouflage at all. I seem to identify more with the male presentation of autism. These sex stereotyping of the condition has caused problems. Uh, past two years, research has been getting away from that, which is fantastic. But I, um, there are two autistic creators that cover this um, in particular, and I'll leave the discussion on the pitfalls in sex stereotyping autism uh, to them, but it's Yo Sandy Sam and Purple Ella. Uh, links to those videos in the description. Uh, I would strongly recommend checking them out, at least one of them. And it's been problematic. As people in the comments have brought up, when you look at other things that were originally thought to be highly uh, gender specific and has been shown to largely not be the case, um, like ADHD or ADD. I'm going to say ADD specifically. I, I do think we diagnose a lot of the time with um, a lot of ADD cases and ADHD specifically. ADHD would be a subset of that. Um, but within ADD, you see two major types, inattentive and hyperactive. Inattentive was believed to be more the male. Hyperactive was believed to be more the female. But I think I might have that backwards. I am not an ADD specialist by any means. Uh, I don't. I don't seem to have it, so I don't know much about it. 
Um, never worked with anybody with it either. I know more about cerebral palsy than I do about ADD. Huh. But those aren't described as gender specific. You don't see male form of ADD or female form of ADD. It's inattentive and hyperactive. That's it. What many in the community thinks is probably the better way to go about it. Uh, addressing this is that you have verbal and nonverbal autism, and then with or without camouflage, right? We covered it all. It has nothing to do with sex because it doesn't seem to have anything to do with sex. Maybe, maybe they are biased one way or the other, but but this doesn't exclude. A typical presentation, a typical presentation for that. And I would encourage looking at it through that lens rather than through a heavily gendered lens. Would recall one of those things I said about why these researchers were thinking that it was a gendered sexed thing. Women have better social skills and are able to use this camouflaging to seem less autistic. There's an article here by, oh, it doesn't have the first name, but uh, H. Amy? Aim? I don't know what that last name is. So, camouflaging predicts internalizing problems in young adults without autism. But it includes with autism. That's a weird title. I wonder if that's a typo, but... Oh, no, this actually was about... Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to include... I'm going to mention this part anyways, but I do need to talk about this article again. I forgot why I included this. This was a finding after, but it was to back up something I said much earlier in this video. So I'll just read this part. Um, additionally, camouflaging predicted internalizing problems over and above social competence, autistic traits, age, IQ, and gender. These results are consistent with previous reports that camouflaging is associated with poor mental health outcomes in autistic individuals. Um, but also, wait, where was the... Oh, uh, results indicate that among non-autistic young adults, those with greater social skills reported less camouflaging, suggesting that increases in camouflaging behavior is associated with poorer social competence. Now. I'm not saying that women or autistic women or anything like that have poorer social skills. I just want to bring this up because it really hits the nail on the head with how these sexual stereotypes have completely polluted the discourse and diagnostics in these conditions and even the research around them. So it's time to get into how this has to do with harm. Okay, this is the second part of the unintended harm. I hinted that camouflaging, masking, whatever you want to call it, is really bad for people's mental health. Hopefully the example I gave, with kind of extending it to non-autistic people, makes it obvious like how along what lines I'm kind of going on here. The, oh, it doesn't have the first name again. So M.K. Pelton and others are autistic traits associated with suicidality. There's a rest of that title. Um, they were able to find that, yes, it was in fact highly correlated, but what exactly is suicidality? Why did they say suicide? And what are the suicidality rates? Suicidality includes the actual suicide attempts, which would include both successful and failed suicide attempts, but also what would be considered a serious um, idealization of suicide. So not, oh, if you break up with me, I'm going to kill myself. That's not suicidality. That is a form of manipulation. Um, 
disgusting when people do that. That is an incredibly very dirty manipulative tactic, but we're talking about somebody who actually thinks they would be better off dead. Yeah. So this is idealization or um, idealization or an actual attempt to die. This is not I'm going to threaten to kill myself for some kind of gain. The suicidality rate in the autistic 35%. It is ridiculously high. Now, as I mentioned, it was found to largely be the result of pushing this masking or camouflaging behavior. EBA largely teaches it, but it's not the only way in which this is learned. A lot of the time, societal pressures, sometimes even parental pressure, will encourage this kind of behavior. It problematic, obviously enough. I shouldn't need to explain that. You're talking about a thing that directly leads to people wanting to die because they think they would be better off. Another study, um, I don't remember which one of these it is, but it's down there somewhere in the video description, found that even when it doesn't lead to an actual suicide attempt, it still leads to an increased amount of internalization of problems. So this is where, instead of seeing a problem for what it is, like, oh, hey, I was trying to talk with this other person, and we just didn't see eye to eye on those things, and whatever. You know, just you can have completely innocent social breakdown in which two people are, neither one of them is particularly at fault. You just have totally different perspectives that are irreconcilable. Um, you're very unlikely to have somebody who grew up um, upper middle class from the city to be able to sit down at a bar and have a good, uh, relatable conversation with somebody who grew up in the backwoods lower middle class, uh, it's like a logger or something. They are almost certainly not going to get along with each other. And it's not that either one of them is socializing wrong. It's that they just have essentially nothing they could possibly relate to each other. When internalization becomes a factor, <clears throat> instead of seeing that for what it is, you would go, oh, I'm a fuck up. I'm a failure. I completely messed this up. This is all my fault. You've seen that in other people. They were quite possibly severely depressed, severely anxious, something. But that is obviously a bad, um, a very bad state to be in. That is, that is a severe mental health problem. So. I don't want to drag this video on too much longer. We're looking at about half an hour, so I kind of uh, call it quits right now. I will be doing another video on the unintended harm at some point. I'll try to put something else in there to um, break this up for a little bit. Uh, I'm not even going to try to promise the next video is going to be tomorrow. I haven't been doing that all that well, so <laughs> there will be a new video at some point this month. Until then, have a good one, guys.